John 19 today, please. John chapter 19, going through the Gospels according to John. And uh, we're getting toward the end of it. This 19th chapter is, uh, it's what I would call holy ground. It really is. It's Jesus as he goes to the cross and faces that death of the cross. It's a time in Jesus' earthly life that is often referred to as his humiliation. When you read the Gospels, you'll realize that actually all the three and a half years of his ministry, he suffered a lot of humiliation. For example, he was accused of being an illegitimate child. He was called a drinker and a drunk. He was even said to be demon-possessed. Well, in chapter 18 and 19, we have here John recording the ultimate humiliation that Jesus suffered during his earthly life and ministry, where he is taken by wicked hands, and he is tortured, and he is executed. Now, I remind you that that Though it happened, was in the plan of God. It was by God's determined counsel that this took place, even though it involved wicked people that conjured it up and that carried it out. But I want us to look at John 19 and just look at it in three parts. First of all, there's the trial in the first 16 verses. And then that trial turns to be fatal. We have his death in 17 to 30, and then quickly in the end, his burial in verses 31 to 42. So that's really the way this 19th chapter breaks up. And I want to share with you as we begin by looking at the trial in just a moment after we pause to pray. So Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity we have to be here. Thank you, Lord, for the Bible. Thank you for this specific portion that we're looking at this morning. What a wonderful work. What a complete work. What an example of meekness, of humiliation, of submission that we have right here before our eyes. Lord, we know the great purpose and the great work that was accomplished. We're the, benefit, we're the beneficiaries of it. We're blessed because of your actions that are recorded here in this 19th chapter. We praise you for it. May the somberness of it, may the joy of it mingle together and uh, really grip us today. As we consider this passage, open our spiritual eyes, enlighten our hearts, we pray, Spirit of God, for Jesus' sake. Amen. So the first 16 verses I said is the trial. And actually, there are six separate trials that Jesus goes through. Now, this is the second time that he appears before Pilate. And it actually began in chapter 18 with, with verse 28. I like to think of it like this. Instead of Jesus before Pilate, I like to think of Pilate is before Jesus. It's like Pilate is on trial here. Uh, the tables really get turned because the fact of the matter is Jesus's trial is a sham. All of them uh, that he endures. It really reveals the fact that wicked men are ganging up and working together to put to death, to kill the most innocent man that ever lived. And at the same time, you see God's graciousness in devising this method of a plan of redemption, that he, the God of heaven, would allow himself to be subjected to this kind of treatment. When I stop and I think about that, I'm just amazed. This is who Jesus is. 
He is the eternal God. In Isaiah's prophecy, he's called the everlasting father. And what he stoops to allow to be done to him is absolutely incredible. It's beyond, uh, it's mind-boggling. It's beyond imagination. This happening to anyone is horrible. But this happening to the God of heaven? Absolutely amazing to me. What condescension. What humiliation. What lowering of himself. How he stooped. Paul says it this way. He didn't see his deity as something to be selfishly grasped onto. He took upon himself the form of a man and then the form of a servant and then became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And you see the progression as he goes down lower and lower. That's what we have happening here right before our eyes. And it's all God's wonderful plan. Look at the violence that is involved here, as is recorded in these first seven verses of John 19. And you know, Pilate clearly indicates he knows that Jesus is an innocent man, that these charges aren't real, that he is being charged with. He knows Jesus is innocent, but what we're going to find out about Pilate is that Pilate is an appeaser. He'll do anything to appease the crowd, the mob, so that they don't riot and he can keep control of them. What we see in the first three verses is the violence of Pilate's soldiers. What you have to, I guess, understand is back in that day, Pilate, his his, uh, palace was actually in Caesarea on the Mediterranean Sea up north. He came to Jerusalem because it was the Passover season. Hundreds of thousands of people would crowd into Jerusalem, and they needed uh, the Roman government to protect and to keep peace. And so Pilate would move from Caesarea down to Jerusalem, and he would stay in Herod's old palace. It was called the Fortress of Antonio in that day, and that's where he was when all of this is played out. He had his palace. And across the courtyard from his palace was the barracks of the Roman soldiers that he had with him to keep the peace in Jerusalem during the Passover. And these are the soldiers that we meet here in uh, verse 1 and 2 and 3 of the opening of chapter 19. What Pilate has done is he has appeased the crowd. He gives the, the, the Lord Jesus into the hands of his soldiers, and his idea is, I'll let them flog him. I'll let them whip him. And, uh, you know, that whipping, by the way, was so cruel and so inhumane and so torturous that often, often, when people were flogged by the Romans, they didn't even live to tell the story. It often was that they died from the flogging. So Pilate orders Jesus to be flogged. And I think he's he's probably thinking, I'll satisfy their bloodthirstiness by having him flogged because the whip had uh, sharp lead ends on it that uh, when it hit the back of the individual, they would jerk it, and it would actually rip strips of flesh right off of the backbone. And so this is what uh, he suffered, that sharp, lead-tipped whip. That's what happens. It just says it very simply. In ver- they took Jesus and scourged him. That's all we're told about it. We don't get the, the nasty details. Verse 2, what else did the soldiers do? They plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. This is, of course, their way of mocking him. The soldiers crown, you, you're the king of the Jews. Oh, well, we're going to make you a crown. And so they wove a crown out of thorns. And we're talking thorns that were several inches long. Interesting to me that when Adam sinned, 
in the Garden of Eden that one of the curses that God placed upon the ground was that thistles, thorns and thistles would grow out of it so that it would even make agriculture and their ability to provide food for themselves and their animals more and more difficult. So thorns are associated with the curse that God placed upon man for his sin. And here's Jesus, who is, as the writers of the New Testament tell us, he is the one who becomes sin for us. He's the one that bears our sins in his body on that tree. And so they put the very symbol of the curse of sin by weaving this crown of thorns and putting it on his head. Doesn't tell us here in this gospel, but we know from the other gospels that not only did they put that crown of thorns on his head, but they hit his head with a stick to knock it down into his brow and uh, to cause it to, of course, be painful. They put a purple robe on. Or a purple robe was a, a color of royalty. You're the king of the Jews. Okay, we're going to crown you and put a robe on you. And they put a purple robe on him. And then it says in verse 3, they mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews. Look at him. And they smote him with their hands. And as they pummeled him, with their fists is what we should understand for that. So the violence, just in those first three verses, there's so much that John doesn't tell us, and he was a witness there at the cross. But then the violence in a different way, it's verbal violence, you might say, picking up in verse four, down through verse seven, and it's the Jewish leaders that are, are the ones doing it. Pilate went forth again, and he said unto them, verse 4, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns, the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold, the man. When the chief priests, the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. They said, we have a law. By our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. So here is the Jewish leaders, and they are stirring up an absolute uproar uh, among the people. They're crying for his blood. They're crying for him to be crucified. And Pilate is agitated because he knows that Jesus is an innocent man. In fact, Three times he says it. He says it in 18, verse 38. He says it in verse 4. He says it again in verse 6 to the same group. He is innocent. I find no fault in him. You remember the Old Testament says, I think this is in Deuteronomy 19, that according to Jewish law, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. The truth is established. Three times he confessed, this man is an innocent man. Pilate knew it, but the Jews are adamant, and he is such a weak, insecure, fearful appeaser in order to keep his position and to keep peace. He is so indecisive that he goes back and forth between Jesus and these Jewish leaders seven times, if you count them up in chapter 18 and 19, seven times he schleps back and forth between the two of them. And then the verdict in eighteen in, in uh, verse 8 of chapter 19, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was more afraid of what? He was a very superstitious man, as many of them were. He was superstitious because they said Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. In other words, he claimed to be God. So did Caesar. Caesar claimed to be the Son of God. And Jesus is, is claiming to be the Son of God. Well, that really spooked him. And that made him afraid, it says in verse 8. And he went again into the judgment hall, and he says to Jesus, where are you from? Whence art thou? And Jesus didn't even answer. And then Pilate is, of course, agitated, verse 10. He says, you're not going to answer me? Speakest thou not unto me? Don't you know that I have the power to, to kill you, to crucify you, or to let you go, to release you? 
I like to think that Jesus spoke very calm and quiet in verse 11. His answer is, thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Here's the verdict. And I like to put it this way. There's superstition, Pilate, versus sovereignty, Jesus. Jesus is in complete control of what's happening to him at this moment. We saw that last week. Remember when the soldiers came to arrest him, what happened to them? They fell backwards. Remember when Peter slashed off the ear of uh, the high priest's servant and Jesus picks it up and heals it as if it never happened? He's in complete control, and that is why he says what he does in verse 11. You know, I didn't say this last week. But I was thinking about it, and perhaps I should say it now. Jesus is facing death, and he is in complete control of the whole situation, which leads me to say this, and that is God will never put his people into a situation that he is not in total control of. God is in perfect control of any situation that he allows his people in. You say, well, if that's the case, then I'm mad at him because I don't like the situation that he's allowed me to be in. Well, that's because your wisdom is so limited. That's because you can only see so little. But God sees the big picture, and God sees the good that he means all of these things to work together for. He's got that infinite wisdom, and he has a greater love for you than you can even imagine. And so he's in perfect control. There's never a situation that you and I are in that he's not in perfect control of. He's called guilty, but it's all based upon politicking. It's fake charges. And he says in that 11th verse to Pilate, the people that have more guilt than you for turning me over to be crucified. The people that are more guilty than you are the people that know because they have the scriptures, the people that know and yet reject the fact that it says in their own scriptures that I am their Messiah and they reject me. And that's a warning. That's a warning to us. We that, we know the Bible. We have a Bible. We read our Bibles, I think. We hear Bible messages. We have Bible teaching. We are more responsible than people that don't have Bibles, that don't have the privilege that we have. God holds us accountable for what we know. There is a principle that the Lord says on another occasion, to whom much is given, much shall be required. And we have been given much. And that's why he says what he does. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin, he says. Well, it turns from a trial to being fatal. Picking up in that uh, section, his trial led to death. Verse 12, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you let him go, you're not a friend of Caesar. And boy, that scared him. He didn't want to be reported. He didn't want the report to get back to Rome that he was playing favorites. When Pilate heard that, he brought Jesus forth. He sat down in the judgment seat. It says, verse 13, and the place that is called the pavement in Hebrew, Gabbatha. The pavement. I've been there, or what they think is the pavement that used to be that courtyard in the fortress of Antonio. You can see the uh, striations in the in the rock from the horses uh, uh, or chariots that went uh, through there. You can see scratched into the pavement what was called the king's game that the soldiers would, would play. 
It's a moving thing to be there and to realize this is the place where Jesus was condemned. This is the place where he was flogged and condemned to die. It's really overwhelming. But that's what he's talking about here. The pavement, it, it, uh, act that, that, uh, word Gabbatha in Hebrew actually means elevated because it was the place where Pilate would sit on the bima, that is, on the judgment seat, elevated and pass judgment from that spot. And so Jesus was there at Gabbatha, at the pavement, where he was condemned to die. Verse 14, it was the preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, and he saith to, to the Jews, Behold, your king, mockery. But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate says, shall I crucify your king? It's like he's inciting them, isn't he? Or shaming them? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. What a bunch of hypocrites they are. They hated Caesar. They hated the Romans. They despised them. But you see how evil the heart is? You see how it all culminates here? In killing the Son of God, the Prince of Life, the Lord of Glory. Verse 16, then Pilate delivered him unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus, that is the soldiers, and they led him away. And now we have a record of the crucifixion. They led him away. Verse 17, and he bearing his cross went forth unto a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. Golgotha is simply the Hebrew word for skull. Why it's called skull? I don't know. Uh, no one really knows. Not because skulls were laying around uh, that area, because that would have been desecration, and, the, and uh, the Jews wouldn't have put up with that. Perhaps it was because the place... Uh, looked like had the appearance of a skull, and that's uh, possible as well. But it was a long procession from the pavement to Golgotha, and it was deliberately long because the Romans wanted to draw attention to Jesus. They wanted to humiliate the prisoner, the criminal that he was being perpetrated as. They wanted to instill fear also. This is what happens when you don't fall in line. And of course, they wanted to provide entertainment for the masses. This is the kind, I mean, you're talking about people that love blood. The Roman Empire, their, their gladiator, uh, and uh, what went on in the Colosseum and the amphitheaters, right? They love blood, they thirsted for blood. It's interesting, the more that you, this is sidebar, the more that you, Submit yourself to viewing violence. The more violence doesn't bother you and you want more, it's like addictive, it's like pornography, violent pornography. But anyway, that's what's going on here. They are taking him from there to Golgotha. Now, we're not sure where Golgotha really is in modern day. Uh, the traditional site is that it is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. You see, what happened? When Constantine, in 321 AD, declared Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire, he not only baptized all of his uh, soldiers and made them Christians, but he, his mother, his mother Helena, she went all over Israel, and she marked the spots where Jesus had been, and she made sure that churches were built or temples or shrines were built on those places. Well, that's what the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is. It's a, it's really a, it's become a, a shrine. And it's, I don't enjoy going there. <laughs> it, it just uh, completely destroys the whole thought of Jesus's crucifixion. It's all under the roof of this gaudy church. There's a different idea. Back in the 
mid to late 1800s, a British general who was also a um, who was also an archaeologist, Charles Gordon, he picked out a spot that he said was probably the real spot because it's a hill that has, if you look at it, it looks like a skull. There's there's caves for the two eyes, and so it kind of looks like a skull. Of course, it's eroding and doesn't look as much <laughs> as a skull like it used to, I'm sure. But there's also a nearby tomb. It's called Gordon's Calvary, and that's where most uh, most tour groups go there, too. Gordon's Calvary, and there's a nearby tomb. But the, the fact that most people don't know is that that tomb isn't first century tomb, second temple tomb. It's pro- probably a Byzantine third or fourth century tomb that they say this is the, the tomb that Jesus you know, rose from. But anyway, that's beside the point. The point is that in all of this, Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. They crucified him. It says in verse 18, with two others with him, but Jesus is in the middle of these two on either side. The crucifixion. It's where the psalmist says, they pierced my hands and my feet. It's the fulfillment of the crucifixion, the, the crucifixion fulfilled that. And then look at this. Pick up in verse 19. Pilate wrote the title. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Jewish leaders didn't like that. They wanted him to change it. Verse 21, say, he said he was the king. He's not. So just, he said he was the king of the Jews. The inscription. I think the inscription was a way that Pilate was insulting the Jews. By saying, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. This is the only king you'll ever have. This is the only king, kind of king you deserve. But it was a true proclamation. Whether Pilate realized it or meant it or not, it was a true proclamation because Jesus is and will be returning as the king of the Jews. It'll be fulfilled. Well, then look at what happens with Jesus' belongings. There's a distribution that takes place. In verse uh, 23, the soldiers, they had when they had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and they made four parts, every soldier part. In other words, there's four soldiers here. And they're distributing Jesus' belongings to these soldiers. They're distributing it four ways, dividing it four into four portions, his sandals, his belt, his coat, his headdress. There is a seamless garment. Not sure if it's the if the inner or the outer garment, but it's a it's a it's a tunic that is seamless, which makes it the most valuable piece of Jesus' clothing. And so they choose not to tear it. Thus to devalue it, but rather to toss dice to see who would become the owner of it so that they could then sell it or whatever. And so that is also a fulfillment of Psalm 22, 18. They cast lots for my vesture is what the psalmist says there. There's others that there's a distribution made to besides the soldiers of Jesus' belongings, but it's not something, it's someone. I want you to see this with me. Drop down to verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and also his mother's sister, and Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. So there's at least uh, four women that are there. And it says, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, well, we know who the writer of this gospel is. It's John, and John never names himself in this gospel, but we know from John 13 that he is the one who is called the disciple whom Jesus loved. Not that he didn't love the other ones, but there was a special connection that Jesus had with uh, his disciple John. So he sees John and his mother, and he says, woman, 
Behold thy son. And then he says to John, the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her unto his own home. This is interesting. When you compare the other gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, to what John says here, you have to conclude that the, the, the woman who is uh, the sister of Mary is Salome, who is the mother of James and John. And it says that Salome, or the mother of James and John, is Jesus's mom's sister. So Salome is his aunt, is his aunt, okay? Which means that John, who he says, behold thy mother, is his first cousin which makes sense. He's giving his first cousin, John. You know, James and John were his cousins, his first cousins, according to the Gospels, when you put it all together. But you know what's amazing to me? One of the most difficult things to do when a person was crucified was to talk and was deliberate. In order to talk, you had to actually expand your lungs, but the crucifixion made it impossible for you to expand your lungs unless you put pressure on the nails that were holding your feet and pushed yourself up to get a breath. That's how you had to breathe. And then down. And you can't speak without breathing. And what I see here is this is one of the seven things that Jesus says from the cross. And here he is in absolute agony. You and I can't imagine the agony of crucifixion. In fact, we get our word excruciating from the root word crucifixion. When something is the most severe pain imaginable, we, we say it's excruciating pain. And it comes from the cross, crucifixion, excruciating. So Jesus was in excruci excruciating pain, and yet in that agony, he's thinking about others. He's talking about others. He, he says, Father, forgive them. <laughs> they know not what they do. Mother, your son. Son, your mother. And he's taking care of his mother in his agony. And then... The end comes. Look at verse uh, 28. Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. And it says, they, there was a vessel full of vinegar. They filled the sponge with vinegar, put it on hyssop stick, put it up to his mouth, and he received the vinegar. That's a fulfillment of Psalm 69. They gave me Vinegar mixed with gall to drink. Bitterness. I thirst, he says. Reminds me of the fact that Jesus, on several occasions in his ministry, said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink, or I give you living water. And if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. And I get the impression here that here he is physically thirsting so that we would never be able, so that we wouldn't have to spiritually thirst again. Amazing comparison here. He says, I thirst. And then verse 30, when he had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. It is finished. Actually, those three words are one word in the Greek language the New Testament was originally written in. And it simply means redemption is secured. Redemption is paid for in full. You know, this is the crux of the matter. Salvation is something that is absolutely received freely. There's nothing you do to pay for it because it's finished. It's been paid in full. And either you, when you think about salvation, either you're in the mode of do or you're done. 
because it's done by him. And if you are mixing works, if there's any works that you think you have to do in order to be saved, then your salvation is two letters short. You're in the mode of do when it's done. It's finished. There's nothing that you can add to a perfect work that Jesus finished. And that's what he meant when he said, to Tetelestai, it is finished. Redemption has been completely paid for in full. Redemption secured. Job done. It's finished. And then he's buried. Verse 31, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day. They, uh, they besought, the Jews besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. You get the idea of what I just explained. If the, if the femur bones of the legs are broken, you can't push up anymore to breathe. And so you suffocate. Okay, And so that's, that's what they're asking. Look, it's going to be Sabbath. We don't want these bodies desecrating Shabbat. Get them down. Bury them before sundown. Especially because this Shabbat is, falls on Passover. And so we need to have these bodies removed. What happens? Notice. Then came the soldiers, verse 32, to break the legs of the first and the other that was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead. So they didn't break his legs. Did you know that that is a fulfillment of prophecy? They didn't have to hasten his death. He was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. In the first Passover, in Exodus chapter 12, and verse 46, that Passover lamb, not a bone of that lamb was to be broken. And he is the fulfillment as the lamb of God. He is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. Not a bone will be broken. He'll be pierced, but his bones will not be broken. So that's actually the fulfillment of prophecy as well as the fact that uh, it says that they looked upon him whom they had pierced. Not uh, necessarily in this particular text, but it is in others. Oh, here it is in verse 37. I, and again, another scripture, they shall look on him whom they pierced. That's the fulfillment of the prophecy in Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10, which not only pertains to that, but it pertains to a future. When Israel's eyes are, be, are opened and the nation is redeemed at the end of Jacob's trouble, they shall look upon him whom they pierce and they will mourn for him. Zechariah 12, 10 says, Revelation 1, 7 talks about every eye shall see him and they, the Jews that, that pierced him, will look upon him when he comes again. Film of the scripture. Then look at verse 38. Joseph of Arimathea, he was a member of that 70 leading elders of the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin. Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He therefore took the body of Jesus. And also there came Nicodemus, who was also a member of that Sanhedrin council of the, the leading 70 Jewish leaders of Israel. He came, that one that came to Jesus by night, he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, a hundred pound weight. They took the body of Jesus. They wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. And then in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. And there they laid Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. Well, here's what's happening here. In the burial, there's not only soldiers that uh, are there that uh, 
hasten the death of the other two, but there are believers there at the burial. These two members of the Sanhedrin, they're secret believers, but now they're willing to be identified. This is, this is important. And Joseph, he quickly retrieves the body of Jesus. He and, and he and Nicodemus, who brought the spices, they wrap the body in the linen uh, windings, pouring in the spices, and get him buried before sundown. And that also is a fulfillment of Scripture, because Isaiah 53, 9 says that he would make his grave with the rich in his death. That grave, we're told by the other Gospels, was the tomb, the family tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And when a Jewish person laid a body in a tomb, that tomb then could not have any other body ever laid in it. That was it. It was a tomb carved out of stone. It was a very expensive burial that Jesus had. And it fulfilled prophecy as well. But I'm glad that these men identified themselves with Jesus. When you identify yourself with the Lord, you may be rejected by other people. And I'm sure they were as a result of this. You may be rejected by your peers. You might lose something that previously was precious to you. But it's okay. Because what you lose temporarily, you'll gain eternally. You see, the Christian life is not about what's in it for me. But rather, the Christian life is how can God use me by pouring him by, by pouring me out to others to bless them. Remember in John 15, the branch, you are the branches, and branches are supposed to produce fruit and he produces the fruit on us, the branches. Well, branches aren't simply to show the beautiful, juicy grapes that are hanging on them. But those grapes are to be taken and trampled under feet so that the sweetness of that juice can then be released from them and it can become a blessing to the people that drink of it. That's exactly what Jesus meant when he said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That is the fact that God will take you and he will crush you so that he can then bless others through you. The song that we sang, Isaac Watts captured it well when he said, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Nothing less than that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity that we've had together to look at the amazing plan of redemption played out right before our eyes, a culmination of it, right before our eyes. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for going through that humiliation for us. Thank you for not uh, stopping until those words came from your agonizing lips. It is finished. Thank you, Lord, that you finished. And you won't finish with us until you come for us. For we are confident of this very thing, that he that hath begun a good work in us will perform it until the day of Christ. What hope we have, what comfort that is, what blessing. So, Lord, we give ourselves afresh to you. We yield ourselves anew. Oh, Lord. Love so amazing, so divine, nothing less than our all will do. So we want to recognize that. And we want to rededicate our all to you and hold nothing back, especially for ourselves, but give it all to you.
all to Jesus. I surrender. Your head's bowed, your eyes closed this morning. God spoke into your heart. God touched your heart about what he did for you. And Have you just thought about it glibly, not really serious about it? You thought, yeah, I've heard that. Oh, that it might mean something more to you today than it ever has before. That you may be, that you may be touched in your heart of hearts and that you might recognize the awful cost that he paid to redeem you, that your life then would be used in a redeeming way for others. For you're not your own. You're bought with a price so that you can glorify God in and through your body, which belonged to him because he paid in full for them. He gave himself for you. Will you give yourself back to him and surrender this morning if you haven't or if you have would you would you make that a fresh surrender today may the lord help us if you don't know him as your savior you just saw a picture of how much he loves you and what he did for you are you going to continue to hold out on him why, why would you perish when God so loved the world, as we've just seen, that he gave himself? If you don't know him as your Savior, you can know him today and have life eternal. You can take him and what he's done for you. You receive him, you have eternal life. So receive him today. Say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I don't deserve forgiveness. I don't deserve a home in heaven. I don't deserve this life eternal. But Jesus, he purchased it for me, and I want to receive him and his his life, his salvation. You'll pass from death to life. 